It's Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Arkansas is the number one ranked baseball team in the country. Today, Bubba Carpenter and I will talk about the Razorbacks' first 19 games, and we'll look ahead to this week's series in Auburn. But first, a word from Kendall King. Kendall King, where it's all about teamwork. Building brands around a design concept, Kendall King takes pride in their skill sets and displays and signing, as well as dot-com photography, content creation, and influencer marketing. The bases are loaded, and the Kendall King team is bringing it home. This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, presented by Kendall King, the first podcast devoted entirely to Arkansas baseball, featuring insight from Arkansas baseball color analyst Bubba Carpenter. Here's your host, Matt Jones. Welcome in to the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, year number six. I'm Matt Jones with Bubba Carpenter, the color analyst for the Razorback Sports Network, former major leaguer, the pride of, is it Brentwood, Arkansas? Brentwood, Arkansas, yeah, yes, sir. Best baseball player to ever come out of Brentwood, Arkansas. <laughs> I almost said Winslow. I know how people get, you know, like if you're from a small town, you got a little small town next to it, you can get kind of territorial. Like if I said somebody's from Y City and they were really from Bowles, you, you might – Get some yeah, we let it all slide. My property was <laughs> – we lived in Brentwood. We lived on a farm, but my we had Winslow School District. We had West Fork up there, so we a little bit of everything. I started at Winslow School, went to West Fork, so I kind of claimed both of them. The Winslow Squirrels. Winslow Squirrels. Not there yeah. anymore. Yeah, no, it's a sad, it was a sad day <laughs> when they shut the school down. So let's talk – you know, so this is obviously our first podcast of the season. It gives us a chance, I think, Bubba, maybe just to look at this thing from a, a you know a thirty thousand feet point of view. What we've seen from Arkansas this year, they're seventeen and two. They're the unanimous number one team in the country. The coaches' poll came out this week. They got all of the first place votes last week. They got eighteen. They shared votes with four other teams. They're the best team in the country, at least based on their body of work to this point. What have you seen from them? What do you like from them? Well, obviously the pitching staff. Mm-hmm. You know, when you go into a season, I know me and Phil, first broadcast, talked about if you've got starting pitching like we have, you're going to be in every game. I mean, mm-hmm. without a doubt, you're going to be in every game. And that's what's happened early on, Matt. I mean, the pitching staff's been dominant. I mean, and I, don't, I don't know what else we can say about them. I've gone over their numbers, and it's just ridiculous. We're first in almost every category mm-hmm. in the SEC, and it's I've never seen anything like and it. And nationally. I mean, they're first well, in whip. They're first in ERA. They're first in strikeouts. They're first in walks versus strikeouts. I mean, it's, it's almost everything. They're at the top of the board. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, it starts – you know, they, they say it, it, momentum in baseball is only as good as the next day starting pitcher. Well, we're pretty freaking good. Every <laughs> The next day is always really yeah. good. And even if you're talking to Tuesday, you got a Colin Fisher that was thrown yeah. on Tuesdays, and he's a freshman, doesn't pitch like a freshman. But our, our Friday, Saturday, Sunday guy, I mean – Molina could start Friday nights on a lot of teams. Mm-hmm. And so it's just right. incredible uh, what they've done so far this year. You know, Hagen Smith, you know, once again, the numbers he's throwing up, they're not even – they're like video game numbers. They're mm-hmm. they are incredible. I mean, Hagen is such a cut above, and he's doing what we really – I can't remember a pitcher doing what he's doing, at least at Arkansas. Maybe you go back to Nick Schmidt. He was putting up similar type of numbers, but he played in a different era as far as, far as equipment. And so they were higher scoring games. Hagen's up here. But then, you know, you got Brady Tiger, you got Mason, and any other year you would think that's a heck of a number one guy on your team, and you got Mason Molina starting third and Tiger starting second. You know, when's the last time, Matt, we've gone in, and, and early in the year you've not seen TBA on a, on a Sunday. Yeah, that's Sometimes right. not even on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. You know, you got your Friday starter, and then you got TBA Friday or Saturday and Sunday. It's it's amazing what we're able to throw out there at a guy, at a, at a team this week, every weekend, and uh, – it's been fun to watch, and I love I love watching Brady Tiger. If you look numbers wise, his numbers are incredible. Yeah, I mean, I mean he's they're actually better than Hagen. I mean, not the strikeout percentage, mm-hmm. but like earn run average and hits hits allowed. Um, I don't know. It's just it's it's amazing to see it, and when you when you go over the numbers, and they just they're just baffling to see how good they've been. I think Brady is second in the SEC, maybe third in WHIP, which is a, a category that I really like. I think it tells you about the quality of a pitcher. And it's not just the fact that we all knew that they had talent in the starting rotation, but they're actually going out and they're producing. How many times have we seen this year where you look up and it's the fifth inning and the other team doesn't have a run yet? Mm-hmm. And and you know well, this is a hitter. That's That gets kind of demoralizing. It starts to, to wear on you. Think about the Missouri series this last weekend where they get shut out the first game, they get shut out the second game, <laughs> they get shut out into, what, the sixth, seventh inning of the third game. 
Uh, that's got to become real mental for a hitting staff. It is, and you could see you could see Missouri's body language. Now, look, they're they're going to struggle in the SEC. Missouri's not a really good team right now. They got a lot of mm-hmm. they got a long way to go to get where they need to be. But they're an SEC baseball team, and I've ne- I don't think I've ever seen domination from a pitching staff over an SEC team. Well, I, I know I haven't. I've never seen anything close to what we saw this weekend. By by Sunday, you could just tell after the first inning, we throw up a couple runs in the first inning. You could look at the body language of the players out on the field, Missouri players, and they were just – they looked beat. It looked mm-hmm. like they were ready to get on the bus and go back to Columbia. I mean, it had been 17 years since an Arkansas team had shut out back-to-back SEC opponents. They did it at the 07 tournament with Schmidt and Jess Todd, two great pitchers. Uh, it had been like 1978 since they had done it back-to-back against the same conference team, and that was against Rice – they beat them three straight times, shut them out three straight times. One of those was a seven-inning game. I mean, we were a solo home run away from seeing something that may have never been done in Arkansas baseball. You know, I wanted it so bad. I'm greedy, Matt. I don't know if you figured that out. <laughs> I, I wanted I wanted to shut out. You know, their four-hole hitter, Curry, jumped the first pitch fastball from mm-hmm. Colin Fisher. If it wasn't for that, we'd be talking about three shutout games because they wouldn't have scored. They wouldn't have, uh, other than that one swing. And you know what? That all that was that was a frustrated freshman four hole hitter that had been carved up all weekend. Mm-hmm. We jokingly said, you know, he had a couple of go call your mommy at bats, which didn't. And we're not disparaging him. We're just saying when you get carved up that bad, only one that loves you is your your mommy. And he had a couple of really bad at bats, and he went up there frustrated, and he got a first pitch fastball and took it what I call an angry swing mm-hmm. and hit it out the right field. If if not, I think we're talking about three. Three shutouts would have been incredible. It seems like this year is a little bit more flipped from what we usually see early in the year. A lot of times you figure out, you know going into the season what your lineup is, and you might figure out your pitching staff like you were talking about. It's kind of been the reverse, though. You know what your pitching is going to be. It's taken a few weeks to figure out what this lineup's going to be. What have been your thoughts about what they're doing at the plate? Well, I think we're getting better as – Every game, I think we get a little bit better. I, I say at the beginning of every year as a coach, I, I coach, and it doesn't matter if I'm mm-hmm. coaching my son's 12U team or if I'm coaching our high school show, summer showcase team. I want to know what kind of team I have. Do I have a team that's going to – are we going to slug the ball? Mm-hmm. Are we going to have to manufacture runs, play some small ball, hit and run, do things like that? I, I don't mm-hmm. – I think the jury's still out, to be honest with you. I, I think we're starting to show the power potential we have. We, we need a lot of home runs against Mizzou. Um, I think we're starting to show that we're a balanced lineup up and down. What I like, if you go back and look at all the SEC numbers, we're, we're, we're low in a lot of the offensive categories. One category we're first in is, is strikeouts. Yep. We've struck out less than any other team in the SEC. Now, 118. At, that hasn't happened for an Arkansas team in a long time. They're now, usually at the top of the list yeah. in strikeouts. Now, it's early, but we've played some good teams. Yep. Jay Madison was a good team. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you say. Uh, Murray State, good team. Obviously, what yeah. we saw at Globe Life, good, we saw good competition. Yeah. Um, so we're not striking out. We're, we're putting the ball in play. We're, and more importantly, we're taking advantage. If the other team makes an error – I don't, I don't have the stats in front of me, but when another team makes an error and gives us a first, uh, an extra out, We're scoring runs. we score. Yeah. And that's what good teams do. Regardless of what the stats ca- say, <clears throat> we're averaging 7.7 runs a game. We're allowing 2.5. It's going to win you a lot of games. I thought Missouri threw out a couple of, uh, of decent pitchers. I don't know where they would fit on other SEC teams. I thought Carter Rustad is, is a good pitcher, and they mm-hmm. hit him hard. Uh, Carrick Jackson, the Missouri coach, told me afterward that's the worst performance he's had all year, probably the best lineup he's seen all year. Uh, you know, I thought the lefty uh, Javen Pimentel uh, kind of carved him up for oh. a little bit for uh, Saturday, and then he had to leave because you know of a, of a, of a, pitch, a pitch count. Uh, I, I, they're not seeing bad pitching, though. To your point, they're not. And you know, they brought in uh, Keaton when they're down yeah. seven. I thought he was one of their best guys. He he was a Friday night guy. Mm-hmm. They brought him in when they're down seven nothing, and he looked really good. Fastball slider combination mixed mm-hmm. in a changeup. Thought he was really good. Pimentel, like you said, I think he's effectively wild. You know, he was running fastballs in on the lefties. Not sure if that was on the scouting report or not, but he was getting our lefties out in, and he would show them a slider away. And, but I think a lot of times catcher was setting up away and he was missing in, mm-hmm. but it was effectively wild. I thought – I agree. I th- I think the guys are there. Now, I'm not – Say anything bad about Carrick Jackson? I don't. I don't understand how he used his bullpen. He brought in some guys. He brought in that lefty, mm-hmm. Magdish. I want to say his name was throwing ninety six uh, from the left side. 
That guy was really good. He didn't bring him in until it's six nothing ball game. I thought Missouri approached that series a little bit like Murray State did a couple three weeks ago, where they were holding guys, hoping yeah. that they might have a lead yeah, fifth, right. sixth inning, and fourth inning, and maybe they could take them the rest of the way, almost like a, a reverse start. I, I think you're right, and they didn't have the chance. They didn't get no. the lead. The one time they had to bring a guy in, I. I thought they brought in the wrong guy, to be honest with mm. you. After Pimatol, mm -hmm. they brought the guy in and, and you know, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs. Yeah. I, I said it. I don't always get it right, Matt, but I can watch a guy warm up, and you just kind of get a feeling because I know our swings. Mm -hmm. I said, this is a big mistake right here. This guy's playing right into our bats. And I don't even think I got it out of my mouth, and, and uh, Stovall hit the home run yeah. over the fence, and then it was back-to-back-to-back. -back -back I mean, it was bang, bang, with, bang. I think yeah. it was six pitches. I mean, and then that was when you just saw the Mizzou team just – they just they their yeah. shoulders dropped and they were like, you so, know, what do we do? I mean, it's like a balloon popping. You, you yeah. you've got a, a scoreless game, and then six pitches later, it's three to nothing. It, yeah. It's amazing. But I tell you, you asked me about this offense. That's what this team's capable of. Now, are we going to string together a bunch of hits? DVH talks all the time about in the SEC. It's hard to throw together, you know, three hits in a row, mm -hmm. two, three, four base hits. This team's going to draw a walk or two. Uh, maybe reach on the air, hit a couple of line drives, and then boom, pop a home run on you. And and we've got the capability up and down that lineup. Every guy in the lineup's got a chance to pop some home runs. And they don't have to score a lot this year because of the way the pitching is going. They don't have to score. They, they don't have to be a, a, a high-scoring lineup. But I, I'm with you. I, I think their offensive production, you can kind of – you talk about this all the time. You can see when somebody's about to take off by the quality of their outs, Right. We saw it with Aloy like two weeks ago, and now all yeah. of a sudden he's hitting really well. I think you're kind of seeing it from Hudson White right now. Uh, this last week he had, what, two or three pretty well-hit balls that you know, just went right to somebody. Right. And I, I think you're starting to see that a little bit more. And then in Peyton Stovall's impact on the lineup is – I think is he's got a great impact on the lineup. I think the day Peyton came in the lineup is the day – Everything started clicking. Mm -hmm. You know, they they put him down in the lineup that first game. Then they put him in the two hole, mm -hmm. and then he went to the leadoff spot. And there's a direct correlation with Stovall being in the lineup, runs scored going up. Yep. I mean, there's there's no doubt that that his presence in that lineup. You know, it, it didn't just lengthen the lineup; it made the lineup better, more experienced. You know what you're going to get out of Peyton Stovall? Mm -hmm. Is he a true leadoff guy? Probably not. But on this, but that's team, where they wanted him. Yeah. I mean, I that's mean, where they wanted him in the preseason. Yeah, so, I mean, he's he's going to do everything a leadoff guy. You want out of a leadoff guy, he probably going to steal a lot of bases. He's going to have good at bats, see a lot of pitches, um, and get on base. What more do you want? Other than a, a guy that's going to steal 20 bags, he ain't going to steal 20, but he's going to hit a lot of doubles and home runs. I think they were averaging seven runs a game before Peyton came back, and now it's eight and a half runs a game since he came back. So, that, I mean, that speaks to your point. Smaller sample size, but the offensive production is better. And what's interesting to me is that now that they're starting to kind of find who their guys are in the lineup, it's the lefty bats, right? I mean, they've got six left-handed bats on this team. you got the bat out now. Well, we're talking hitting. I figured it's only appropriate. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows this, but when Bubba does the games at the stadium, you're holding a bat the entire time, right? I hold it a lot, yeah. You know, what's crazy, I didn't even Except for when you put it down to, to film Kendall Diggs' home runs. Yeah, I, that's I'm psycho, <laughs> Matt. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I don't know. I didn't realize I was doing it, but when we when we're hitting, I tend to hold my bat. When we're when we're on defense, I hold a ball. And, yeah. And someone videoed it and showed it to me. And I didn't realize what I was doing, but I'm a little bit crazy sometimes. So this is a bat that we just found in the back room here. The the bat at the stadium. Where did that come from? Uh, it's one of my bats from the Yankee organization, okay. and and I can't. It's one that it's actually broken. It's got a little break right here, but I kept it because it has a ball mark right on the barrel. That you can still see the seam marks and you can mm -hmm. see the MLB logo on okay. it. So I saved it. Now all the marks down here on the handle, I I got alcohol and scrubbed all those off where I got jammed. But I kept the barrel <laughs> shots. <laughs> that's what that's what hitters do. Okay, so left-handed bats. They've got six on this team. Reese Robinette sitting out. He's probably going to redshirt this year. He hadn't played yet. The other five are really producing. We talked about Stovall. You've got Kendall Diggs. You've got Nolan Souza. You've got Ross Lovitz, and you've got Ben McLaughlin you probably would say those are the five best hitters in the lineup right now, maybe outside of Aloy. I think so, and I think Aloy's showing what he's capable of doing. And I think Aloy being sandwiched, whether you put him in the two or three hole, between those really good veteran lefties, he's going to get pitches to hit. You know, I mean, you can't really pitch around Aloy, but what I like about Vahiva, I know you're talking about lefties right now, but I think it plays into Vahiva. The, how the success the lefty has, that's going to help Vahiva because mm. let's say you're facing a, a righty, 
you know, you can't pitch around Vahiva and try to get him to chase sliders now. He's not chasing that slider out of the zone. Plus, you got like a Ben McLaughlin or a Kendall Diggs after Vahiva. You got it. You got to pitch to Vahiva, and you know what happens when you pitch to him. He gets a if he gets a ball in the zone, he hammers it. Have you ever seen anybody swing as hard as he does? It's like when he commits to swing, he is going to give it everything that he has. You know, I say a swinging bat's a dangerous bat. That dude swings it. I, <laughs> I love amazing. it. Now, I also say. You know, good hitters are defined by what they don't swing at. And mm. then people can probably get tired of hearing that. I say it all the time, but I mean it, and it's so true. You can look in the history of the game, other than Vladimir Guerrero, um, he's probably the only exception to the rule. Good hitters swing at good pitches, bad mm-hmm. hitters swing at bad pitches. But he early on was pressing. And, and I love what DVH said in one of the post games. He said he feels like we've got guys going up there trying to get hits. Mm-hmm. When you try to get hits – Bad things happen. You try to do too much, chase pitch out of the zone. I think right now, Vahiva's relaxed. He hit that ball 468 feet. Ever since that at bat, he's like a been a different person. He worked an 11-pitch walk the other day. I thought that awesome. was huge for him. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, and so you see stuff like that. But back to our lefties, when you've got that many veteran lefties in a lineup, that's a dangerous mix. And the thing I like about them is they can hit lefties. Mm-hmm. They're They're, they're – they don't change. Their their splits aren't really big, righty versus lefty, which mm-hmm. is huge. I want to go back to – well, first off, just put a bow kind of on the, the general talk about the Razorbacks. How good are they? Because it feels to me like this is a team that's good enough to be right there challenging to go to Omaha at the end of the year, probably at their home ballpark based on the way the RPI looks right now. I mean, the RPI is not going to go down – as you play SEC teams, unless you just tank, and I don't really see that happening. I, I see them winning a lot of SEC games. James Madison, like you said, I think they're a lot better than the Sun Belt coaches thought they were. They were picked to finish 10th in their league. They just went to Coastal Carolina this last weekend, and they took them down to the wire. I mean, finale, rubber game, 13 innings. They had the lead in the 13th and, and gave it away. I think they're a, a really good team. We know how good Coastal is. Uh, Murray State. That was an old team. I mean, I think half of their lineup was halfway to Social Security. <laughs> they were old, old team, man. I mean, probably the oldest team I think I've ever seen come through here. I think they're really good. I think they're going to challenge in a good baseball conference in the Missouri Valley. McNeese, I don't know. Oregon State, they're really darn good. I mean, right. they're, they're Arkansas's challenger right now for number one in the country. Oklahoma State's a little bit down. But I think the point is that these teams, UCA's better than I think people thought they were going to be in the ace hunt. Right. These teams that they played early in the year – I think they're going to win a lot in their conferences, and that's going to help build the RPI. And then if you win, I mean, even at 500 or better in the SEC, your RPI is going to be fine, and you're going to be right there for one of the top eight seeds in, in the country at the end of the year. I think so. And and, and I don't see this team struggling, for like like having colossal meltdowns and, yeah. and losing streaks because of their pitching. Yeah. You know, it's easy to go back. I mean, lineups are going to struggle. I mean, lineups, you see them year in and year out. You might face a hot team in the SEC that their pitching has a really good weekend. You don't score a lot of runs. I don't see this team really struggling because of their starting pitches. It's, you know, knock on wood, everyone's got to stay healthy. But even if someone were to go down, there's enough guys that can step in and do the job. And that's that's incredible, the, this, the depth of this pitching staff. And we're talking about the three starters. We haven't even got into all the weapons out of the bullpen that we have. I think it was you. I was talking to this about in the hallway at the, the baseball stadium the other day. It's – because I've had this conversation with a couple of people, but it, it doesn't feel like this team has that one guy that you're just scared to death if he gets injured. Right. Hagan obviously is so good, but you know a lot of times in the lineup, it's like if this guy goes down or this guy goes down, you don't feel good about. I feel like they're deep enough that they can plug and play. I think so. I mean, there's there's so many options in the bullpen, and even if let's say one of the starters went down. There's guys you can throw in there. You, I, I feel confident throwing Colin Fisher in there in a, as a weekend guy. But even if not, you could do kind of a, an opener and then throw mm-hmm. some relievers, do a bullpen day. There's guys down there not getting work that, that need to pitch, but we, there's not enough innings. We're either run ruling people or uh, yeah, they're just not getting a throw enough. And there's some injuries that are part of this. We've, we've seen Dylan Carter come back. We haven't seen Ben Bybee in a game this year. If you haven't seen Ben Bybee since last season, you haven't seen Ben Bybee. Now, he's got to come back and, and pitch the way that he was. But in the summer, he was really good in California. In the fall, he was really good in his preseason work. Uh, he had a hamstring injury that took him out of his first game or his, his first scrimmage. But it was really good until then. Hunter Dietz is a left-hander who they thought was going to go pro. 
big six foot six lefty who can throw upper nineties. He's coming back in early April. Uh, Cooper Dossett is a pitcher who I know you love. Uh, you, right. you, you grew up coaching, or you grew up coaching him. You know what I'm trying to say. Right. Uh, he's. I, I think he pitched really well against Missouri the other day. He's looked good in all of his outings. I think there's a lot left in that bullpen tank. I think so. I mean, you know, and, and Gabe Gackle. He's I, phenomenal, I love, isn't he? He does not. I interviewed Gabe. Um, he reminds me a lot of Brady Tiger mm. as a freshman. Just his confidence out there on the mound. He's been into, I don't know how many bases loaded situations, just goes in and makes good pitches. I mean, he's inherited 10 base runners this year and he hadn't given up a run. It's pretty impressive. And two of those were with the bases loaded, and I think I think it's seven of those 10 were in scoring position. I liked, I liked his last outing where he came in, got his strikeout. Um, next pitch was like a three- or four-hole lefty. Mm-hmm. Bases loaded, two outs, calmly threw him a first-pitch changeup, got a roll over to second base. And, you know, you look at his changeup's probably his third-best pitch. If you make a mistake with that changeup, Matt, in that situation, it's a grand slam over mm. the Hunt Center. He calmly threw it, perfect pitch, started middle, faded away, got an easy tapper to the right side. Um, that's a confident pitcher right there that's got like, enough confidence to go to what I consider his third best pitch. Um, he's got a curveball they never use. He's basically throwing fastball slider change. Mm-hmm. He's got a really good curveball, but he hasn't needed it. Because his curveball, his slider's been so good, he hadn't had to go to the curveball. But he's a guy that at, he'll be a starter next year. He might be a Friday night guy next year. Who knows? Yeah. He's, um, but he's got starter stuff. But he's coming out of the pen, mm-hmm. kind of like a Tiger did. Yeah. And so it's fun to watch. And you mentioned Bybee. I loved Bybee last year as a freshman. He didn't act like a freshman. He didn't pitch like a freshman. I'm looking forward to seeing him at some point. I don't know when. I've had a conversation with Matt Hobbs before. That freshman class last year, Bybee, Dossett. Uh, who else am I missing? Fouch. Christian Fouch, Gage Wood. It reminds me a lot of that freshman class with Blaine Knight and Isaiah Campbell and those guys yeah. in that they had to pitch in some situations that you really don't want to put a freshman in because of injuries and, and other things, but it made them grow up. And I think that that group's going to be really good by their junior year. Not to say they're not good now, but I think they're going to be really good by the end just based on that they had to grow up a little bit quicker uh, than a lot of pitchers have to do usually. Well, and I think it's a it's a testament to – Matt Hobbs, Zach Barr, DJ Baxendale, um, they do a good job of developing these guys. Like mm-hmm. if you look at Cooper Dossett, he learned a cutter. They want him to throw that cut fastball about 50% of the time. They moved him over to the third base side of the rubber. And when I say they, I ask Hobbs all the time, did you move him over there? Hobbs <laughs> doesn't ever want to take credit for it. But he's like, oh, well, you know, we just mess with it. And mm-hmm. he's real comfortable on the third base side. Mm-hmm. It really sets him up for that cut fastball, cutting across the plate. Cooper's been awesome. Um, Fouch learned a two-seam fastball a couple weeks ago, threw it the other night, was throwing it 99 miles an hour in on the righties. He threw one pitch, Matt. Came in 99, went out 33 miles an hour. You know how hard it is to hit a ball 33 <laughs> miles an I hour? I think I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know how bad that guy's hands was hurt, were hurting? Oh, man. Um, but that just goes to show you how nasty fouls yeah. can be. Learning that two-seam fastball. Now he's not just a four-seam fastball splitty guy. He's got the two-seam fastball. He's got the splitty. Now he's in and got a slider to go with it. The guy's got closer stuff. He throws upper 90s, and it's easy. It looks like he'd throw 110 if he really tried. You're old enough that you probably remember this term in baseball. I didn't get used to a whole lot anymore, but the fireman, you know, the bullpen, mm-hmm. that's what Gabe Gackle is. He's, yeah. he's the fireman for he, this team because, my goodness, I mean, he's been in some tough situations. I, I And I think about Oklahoma State right out of the gate, first time he's ever pitched in a – well, I guess second time he's pitched in a college game, but the first time he's ever pitched away from, you know, home and in any type of, if you want to call it a, a – I don't know if it was a – it was a home environment. Let's put it that way in Arlington. It it, it really wasn't a, a split environment. But it's a tough situation for him to come into. In the ninth inning, bases loaded, one out, 1-1 one, one game, and he keeps it and then sends him to extras. I thought that was incredible, and he's done it over and over again. Yeah, that's when I think his – his uh, how can I say it nicely? His backbones grew a lot that weekend. <laughs> he, uh, he showed a lot. I mean, that's a tough situation. Of course, it was what twenty thousand fans, probably sixteen thousand of Razorback fans. But it was. Loud. Uh, I'd say it's about nineteen five out of twenty thousand of Razorback. Okay, okay. Oklahoma State <laughs> did not travel down there at all. But it just goes to show what he's capable of as a freshman, yeah. and he's just going to get better. He's throwing ninety five to ninety eight miles an hour. Um, And it's more than having good stuff. You know this. To succeed in the SEC, I mean, you've got to have it right here. You've Mm -hmm. got to have it here. A lot of guys have good arms, but they can't get outs. He's got got it all. He's going to be good. 
We got more coming up on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. We've got some Q&A submitted by you, the listeners. We'll also look ahead at the Auburn series. But first, a word from our sponsor. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are design. All right, welcome back into the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. A new feature that we've got this year is that we're going to take some Q&A from, from you, the listeners. And I asked on our Whole Hog Sports premium boards earlier this week, what are some questions that you have? And, and we've got some questions, and Blake Sutton, our producer, is going to help us with this. Blake? All right, first one is from Hog 2009. What are love your... these names, by the way, Bubba. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the catcher position? Any chance Dave Van Horn will opt for a defensive replacement like Parker Rowland late in game? Well, I don't think you need a defensive replacement. I think Hudson White, if he starts a game, will probably finish a game. Unless there's like a some sort of matchup where he's struggling at the plate, there's a tough closer righty. They want to match up with a lefty at the plate. Um, Hudson White was more as a, known as an offensive catcher till he came here. He's worked really hard now mm -hmm. on his defensive ability. So, you know, now with that being said, Parker Rowland, we wouldn't have won the SEC last year without Parker Rowland. I mean, he's a huge piece of this puzzle. Um, you know, but you look at all our catchers, they're all good. They all receive well. Mm -hmm. We're top in the nation in stealing strikes. They've got a, uh, there's a, there's initials for it. I'll get you the. I'll get you it's the. It's like initials. strikes above. Uh, what is it? I know what you're talking about. I've talked yeah. to him about this. I talked to Parker <laughs> Rowland for a long time about it. And if you look at Hudson White, uh, even Helfrich for a freshman steals a ton of strikes. They're all right up there in the in the lead in the nation in in stealing strikes. Mm -hmm. They do a great job. Uh, Hudson Polk hadn't been behind the plate that much, um, but his bat's been. I mean, his strength at the plate is ridiculous. Uh, when he hits the ball, he crushes it. So I don't know that there's a really a need for a defense replacement. I think you might see it, like I said, if maybe Helfrich starts a game, you might see, um, you know, a pinch hit, you know, lefty come off the bench, pinch hit for Helfrich, and then you might see a Parker Rowland come in and finish out the game. But other than that, I don't think we really need it because they're all really good behind the dish. I just want to give you a quick number here. Parker Rowland in 38 innings catching this year. Catch this, Bubba. 0.71 ERA, 0.76 whip. When it comes to weekend pitching, 0 3 one ERA and a 0 6 zero whip. I mean, he has got such a great feel for calling games, and I think that's a little bit of a of a uh, maybe an art that that people don't understand that these catchers are doing. He's he's got a great feel for it, and you can see it in in the performances. And it's not just the the receiving part we're talking about; it's the calling the pitches too. Mm. It's it's putting down the right. Well, we're not putting down fingers anymore, but it's calling <laughs> the right pitch. It's pushing the right pushing button. the right button on your <laughs> kneecap. Yeah, and I love to sit in the booth behind the catcher and watch how they're setting up a hitter, mm -hmm. and it's masterful. This weekend, I, hats off to our our catchers for calling a phenomenal series this weekend against Mizzou. It's like they knew what the hitter was thinking, and they called the opposite pitch. Now, I, there might be a little bit of input from the dugout. I don't know, but you can just tell. You can tell. The guy's looking for a certain pitch. Maybe he's sitting off speed. Boom, they throw a slider by him. And the catchers, have, they've done a great job. All right, Blake. Okay, next question is from Southpaw. Why does everyone slide head first nowadays? Does it increase the chance of injury as opposed to sliding with your feet first? We've seen this a few times. Well, I'll tell you what. I have a pen in my – who who asked this question? Southpaw? Yeah. All right, good. I'm a Southpaw. <laughs> I have a pen in my left knuckle right here. And no, I don't know if you can see it or not. Left middle finger hand knuckle from sliding head first into second base. I mm. hit the second baseman coming across to make a tag push my finger over and slam. Now we have oven mitts. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I wore a glove, I, or I put gloves in my hands, kind of like a, a Sprague Lot does. Yep. He didn't wear the oven mitt. He carries two gloves. But there's something about going head first. Some people say it's not faster to go head first. I disagree. I always felt like I got to the bag faster going head first. And then in today's game of replays, a lot of times you go feet first in, mm -hmm. your foot can come off the bag. 
as you're making that transition from your foot to your butt, a lot of times there's a slight you come up mm-hmm. off the bag. That's why I think I really honestly think replay has a lot to do with guys going <laughs> in head first nowadays. All right, Blake. Okay, next question is from Suey Squad. Do you think Nate Thompson teaches his team to swing for home runs? Now, this was part of kind of a more convoluted post uh, from a poster who I really like. But basically, the the th- the the question was, and it was more of a, a comment. There is this, you know it. There is a a, a notion out there that this team team is a an, a home run or bust team. Not necessarily this twenty twenty four team, but I'm talking about over the last six seven years the program. I don't think it's true. I mean, you've talked with Nate a lot of times about his hitting. I have too. I think they're very much into line drives, hunting pitches, finding a pitch that you're looking for and, and, and being able to drive it to the wall. If it goes over the wall, great. But they like doubles off the wall just as much as they like home runs. Yeah, I know. I know Dave likes doubles. So I think we've had teams in the past <clears throat> to answer this question um, that there's been a lot of guys in the lineup that wanted to hit home runs because they think the more home runs they hit, their draft stock goes up. Mm. Now, is it a product of what Nate teaches? No. I watch, I'm out there for BP. You know, my son went out for BP on Saturday, and we were mm-hmm. out in left field. I think two balls were hit out into left field by right-handed hitters, um, pull home runs. Mm-hmm. They want them hitting line drives gap to gap. And when you're when you're hunting balls gap to gap and you're trying to square that ball up, you miss hit one, it's going to go out. These guys are all strong enough. They can hit it out the left field, right? You know, it doesn't matter. Pull side, it doesn't matter. They can go back side on you. Uh, but they're not trying to hit home runs. They're trying to hit hard line drives. When that pitcher get, makes a mistake and gives you the pitch you can hit out, these guys are going to hit it out, but they're not trying to. I ask these guys all the time, hey, what was your approach right there? Were you looking for that pitch? No, nah, I was just looking to stay up the middle, and guy mm-hmm. made a mistake, and I got, you know, I reacted and, and, and crushed it. But, you know, I, I think there's a big misconception about what Nate teaches versus what the hit what you see on the field mm-hmm. just because a guy strikes out mm-hmm. on a 98 mile an hour fastball on top of the zone it looks like oh the guy's swinging underneath he's trying to hit a home run a lot of times it's just a product of a good pitch you know so uh, i hope that helps answer that question but again the strikeouts are down this year they're yeah. they're not striking out nearly as much like all right next question comes from danny who is arkansas's closer and why this is easy yeah you want to start? It's Go Gabe ahead. Gackle. I, mean, <laughs> it, yeah, I don't know that they've got a traditional closer. And, and by that, I mean, I don't know that they're going to go to Gabe Gackle two times a weekend if they've got a chance to. I think that there are other pitchers on the back end who they feel good about. I think Cooper Dawson may put himself in a, a position to do this with the way that he's pitched lately. Jake Faraday, we saw it early in the year. Uh, he's he's had a little bit of command issues the last time or two that he's come out. But I think he's – Right there. And then, you know, like what they did with Will McIntyre on Saturday against Missouri, if he's rolling, you just let him go four and a third instead of three and a third and, and don't worry about bringing somebody in for the ninth. I think there's a lot of different options, but the first out of the pen has got to be Gabe Gackle. Yeah, I think if we get a bases loaded situation in the ninth or a one run game in the ninth, Thursday night in the Sound Auburn, the fire alarms. Yep, you're going to see Gackle. <laughs> but here's what I love I, to expand on that. Here's why I love. Dave Van Horn, he doesn't go by the analytics. Mm-hmm. He trusts his eyes. We talked about Pima Talk coming out. Mm-hmm. He could have gone back out there. He was only, what, 76 pitches. He could have gone out again. I don't think they wanted him to face the lineup a third time. Yeah. It backfired on him. Um, Joe Torrey always said, "With all, the analytics are great, but the game's got a heartbeat. And mm-hmm. I think when you get to those late-inning games, if they've got – if McIntyre's out there and he's dealing, McIntyre's going to close out the game. If If – if Dossett's on the mountain, Dossett's dealing, he's going to close out the game. Whoever, Cody, whoever's out there dealing, if if guys are taking bad swings, I think Dave's going to stick with them. And I think that's why I love Dave Van Horn. He doesn't go, okay, this is my seventh inning guy. This is my eighth inning. You know, I think I think they're all good and they all have a role. All the walk-up songs and the walk-out songs reminds me that the players don't listen to the same kind of music I listen to. But if they did, <laughs> I'd have George Strait, the fireman, play him when Gabe Gackle came out. I think yeah. it'd be kind of fun. Or uh, you probably you don't remember Phil Stidham back in the day. I think he's the all-time saves leader still. Yeah. Um, he played uh, MC Hammer, Can't Touch This. <laughs> that's what he came out to, and uh, they, they couldn't touch it. Seems like all the closers now, they want Metallica. That, that's yeah. kind of the go-to band. Blake? All right, next question comes from you to man. What is the normal batting practice routine? How many rounds? Do they have a specific goal with each round of batting practice? You're out there for batting practice. You yeah. answer this well. Absolutely. It's very regimented. They start out. 
they have kind of an execution round. You know, they'll they'll bu- lay down a couple of bunts. They'll do a hit and run. They'll move the runner over. They'll drive a runner in. Next round, it's more of a gap to gap round. A lot of times, the hitter will dictate. He'll say like, "Work me away," and you know they'll say, "Okay, you know, batter's eye or L screen," and they're getting pitches they can drive mostly center right center. Um, but pretty much every round they have a purpose. You know, there might be a time that last round, if they get a couple of cookies inside, they're going to play pepper with the scoreboard in left field. But everything is pretty much regimented. Now, if a guy is struggling with a certain whatever they're struggling with, maybe pulling off the ball, his whole round will be center, right, center gap, or lefty, center, left, center gap to just try to get that swing right before game time. It's all For me, it's about swing direction, swing plane, swing path, getting your back going in the right direction at the right time. And so, yeah, there's a they're not just up there hacking away like mm. like, like we used to do at times. It's, uh, it's very regimented, and they go up there, and every swing has a purpose. And uh, it's fun to watch. If you've never watched a Razorback BP, it's, it's a fun thing to watch. I don't know that you can get in and watch BP. They don't open the gates until 90 minutes before the game. By the time they open mm. the gates, the other team's out there. Yeah, I guess you got to go on the road to see them take BP then. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we got one more by Blake. All right, last question is from Gentry Razorback. How is left field going to work out? It's been a kind of a rotating door. It feels to me, though, like Ross Lova just is kind of taking over that position right now. Yeah, you know, Ross, um, man, and it's tough. It's it's tough, man, because I love I love Jason Jones. Mm-hmm. I love talking to Jason about hitting. You know, there's some guys just bring a certain energy. Um, I, I love when I talk to him. I really do. And I think he's got a chance to be really good. He's just got to put it all together. You talk about BP. If you could get Jason Jones's BP into a game, mm-hmm. he'd be one of the best hitters in the SEC. The guy's phenomenal. Um, another guy that could work into the outfield later on could be a, a Souza. They've been he's been taking fly balls during batting practice. So he's a guy that could go out there and play some left field. He's athletic. He might be one of the most athletic guys on the team. He could go out and play some. He's been shagging in center field, a little bit of left. Uh, there's multiple guys, but I think to your point, I think Lovich right now is kind of the guy that's been getting it done. He's earned earned some starts out there. So I think I think Thursday night at Auburn, I think that's who we'll see out there. Has he been better defensively than you thought he'd be? Yeah. Yeah, I think he has for me too. Yeah, yes. I thought takes, I thought he was maybe a little bit of a defensive liability who was brought in for his bat, but I mean, I th- they played him in center a couple of times. Even I think that they maybe like his his defense more than I thought it, it would it would be. You know, you don't have to be fast to be a good outfielder. You got to you got to get good reads, and I, I think pitch calm helps because as a center mm-hmm. fielder, if you know what pitch is coming, you know your pitcher stuff, you know the hitter at the plate, you've got an idea of who's hitting that can give you that extra step that it needs to make a play that you might not normally make. And so I, I watch Lovich's route, and even though he's not a speed burner out there, he takes good routes to the ball, and that, for me, that's the key. This is more fun than talking about the SEC, right? This is what we usually do in this segment. Oh, yeah. so <laughs> much. Let's talk about our guys. I don't care what's going on in Ole Miss and Vandy. <laughs> uh, we do care about what's going on in Auburn. That's where Arkansas is going to play yeah. this weekend. Auburn is 14-6 and six overall. They're 0-3 in the SEC. They got swept at Vanderbilt last week by a combined score of 33 to 12. I don't know about you, but when I think about Butch Thompson's teams at Auburn, I think about pitching and I think about defense. And those are not strong points for them this year. I mean, they come in, they've got a I don't they beat South Alabama 2 to 1 on Tuesday night, so I don't know how much that affected their overall team ERA, but it was over 5 coming into the week and that was the 12th uh, best ERA in the SEC only Florida and I think Missouri had worse than than Auburn did defensively. They've got more errors than any other team in the SEC coming into the week. 21 errors. They're fielding 969. And so to me, it's not your normal Auburn team maybe than we've become accustomed to seeing. Yeah, it seems kind of reversed. They always seem to hit. Um, and I think they're going to hit. I mean, offensively, they always seem to have guys that drive the ball. So they're going to be pretty good offensively. And that but- part plays small. Mm-hmm. And I think they – I've got some numbers here to back this up, but I, I think they play – that park really well. They 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 hit for a lot of power there. But to your point, if you look at their their pitching numbers, they're eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth. Yeah. They're they're all they're at the they're in the bottom pack for pretty much every pitching category there is. They're they're scuffling a little bit on the mound, mm-hmm. and a lot of that goes back to their defense too, not making plays for them. But they um, had seven errors in a game against Austin P this year. Wow, it's tough to make seven errors. I mean, seven errors is that's a lot, and it was on their home field. You know, like. You shouldn't be making seven errors on your home field. You know no. that grass. You know that dirt. No, and even on turf, you know, and yeah. Vandy, you know, 
you shouldn't be making errors at Vandy either, should you? <laughs> you know? That's a weird. That's that's a different kind of ballpark. I, I don't yeah. put anything past that place. That's, that's true. <laughs> but I mean, so Auburn is a team to me that I feel like they get overlooked a little bit. They've been to the World Series two times in the last five years since nineteen. We didn't have a tournament in twenty. So two of the last what four or five years that there's been an NCAA tournament, they've been in the College World Series. But they're picked fifth to win, or they're picked fifth in the division this year, only ahead of Ole Miss and Mississippi State. That might speak more to the strength of the division than anything else. Uh, it feels like a series Arkansas ought to be able to go down there and, and win. You don't ever assume anything in the SEC, especially not when you're going on the road. But I think I would be a little bit surprised if Arkansas didn't come back with at least a couple of victories this week, yeah, based on the stats. So. I think so, Matt, and based on their what they've done so far, what they've showed, but. You know, the thing about the SEC, and you know this, it's it's not necessarily the, the best team that wins. It's the best team that weekend that That's wins. Right. And yep. so anything can happen. I mean, we could, you know, we go down there and have a bad weekend. We're, we don't, our defense isn't where it's going to be. I think our defense has gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. I think we're starting to make plays. I think early on we were still feeling our, out our defense. But I think right now, I mean, we've got a lot of different options we can go to. Um, but yeah, I, I, if we if we don't win the series, it's a it's a huge disappointment. Now you you hate to talk sweep, but like I said earlier, I'm I'm kind of greedy, and <laughs> I I honestly would not be surprised if we went down there and got a sweep. If we mm. win two out of three, it's all about winning series. Yeah. But I want the sweep. I'm if, I'm, I'm greedy like if, that. If you win the first two, it really puts a lot of pressure on the home team in Game Three. It does. And I don't know who their, their game three starter is yet. Probably Joseph Gonzalez. We haven't gotten a rotation from yet. I mean, if they go like they did last week uh, the, at, at Vanderbilt, they went Chase Alsup, who's a right-hander in game one. Uh, they went with a left-hander, Carson Myers, who's a transfer from Alabama-Birmingham in game two. And then Joseph Gonzalez, he was kind of their guy two years ago. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be their guy last year, pitched one game, didn't pitch again. And then he's kind of been in and out of the rotation this year. And none of them really have very strong numbers. I'm, I'm trying to find it here. ERA seven one five six nine two four seven nine for those three uh, whips of one six three one nine two and one five zero. Those are numbers that I feel like if you're Arkansas, maybe don't know if your eyes get big, but but you feel like maybe you could do some damage against that. Yeah, I think when you go in as a hitter, you look at those numbers, and you're like you you like your chances. Yeah. Um, they, I don't feel like they have, they don't have a Hagen Smith, a Brady Tiger. Nope. I mean they, they do don't. Not. I mean it it is what it is. I mean just. You know, it's all right. We we're not looking for bulletin board material. I don't think they're listening to our podcast, but I mean, it is what it is. They yeah. don't have, they don't have our three starters. They don't have our bullpen. Now they're going to have a couple of good arms. I mean, they always do, but mm -hmm. it's it's just a different animal. What we're running at them this weekend. They their numbers remind me a little bit of Missouri's numbers coming into last week. Now I think they played better competition than Missouri did before they came to Arkansas. But Missouri, it was an ERA over five. I think they had a 287 batting average coming into the weekend last week. I mean, Auburn right now, like we said, their ERA is somewhere around five. After last night's game against South Alabama, their uh, batting average is, is 281. Now, one thing that I think is different about Missouri and Auburn is that Missouri came in, they were striking out a lot. I think they were striking out over nine times a game. And so you looked at that and you looked at what Arkansas is doing. It's like, okay, that's, that's probably going to play. Auburn's only striking out about six times a game. Arkansas is the only team that struck out less than Auburn. But – they have struggled with some of the big arms. They faced Brody Breck, the big right-hander at Iowa, mm -hmm. probably going to be a first-round pick this year. Struck him out 11 times in six innings. Uh, they played Vanderbilt last week, like we said. Carter Holton, lefty, probably going to be picked on day one. He shut them down for seven innings. So, the you know, if, if there's a pattern there, you got to feel like Hagen Smith's probably got a pretty good chance to go deep into this game based on the way that he's been pitching and the way that Auburn has looked against elite arms this year. I, th I think you're right. I think uh... – you could look at Mizzou, though, and you knew, like I said, it's Sunday going in. One thing I'm pretty good at is reading swings. Mm -hmm. Reading Missouri swings and then looking at Mesa Molina's fastball that has carry on it. I'm, I, I told Phil, I said, these guys don't have a chance. If Mason mm -hmm. can throw his fastball above the belt, these guys aren't going to hit it. Mm -hmm. They may be mixing a changeup. I mean, the they just didn't match up well for Missouri. Now, I haven't seen the the Auburn hitters. I haven't seen their yeah. swings, but I've seen our guys throw and I know if if they're if they're if they're doing their thing that they've been doing, it'd be a long weekend for for Auburn hitters. And I think I think our hitters are going to go in and I really like the way we're trending, Matt. Um the strikeouts, I hate strikeouts, so the fact that we're not striking out, but I, I love our at-bats. 
And McLaughlin said something to me last week about this team starting to come together. They're starting to understand the, the importance of just kind of passing baton to the next guy. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be the guy. Let the next guy do it. If you don't get a pitch to hit, you know, um, um, Nolan Sousa is a perfect example of it. He took a 3-1 fastball off the plate. It was a strike. I said off the plate. It was a strike. He got a 3-2 pitch and hit it over the hunt center. Um, a good hitter takes that 3-1 pitcher's pitch. A uh, bad hitter swings at that 3-1 pitcher's pitch, rolls over it, and inning over. Mentioned that Auburn's got a weird kind of ballpark. Unique might be the right word. Uh, but it's, it, they, they slug over 200 points better at home than they have away from home this year. They've got that big green wall in left field, kind of a replica of Fenway, uh, about 315 down the left field line. It's easy to hit a home run to left if you get it up in the air, especially with the way the wind can blow down there. It's got that weird little uh, – I don't know what you would even call it. It's, it's – uh, it goes from about 330 to 350 in a hurry in the left center field gap because there's this kind of a, an odd shape, you know, portion of the wall, right field a little bit deeper than it is uh, to left field. We've seen a lot of home runs when Arkansas has gone down there and played in the past, and that brings me to this: they're putting on a gorilla mask when they hit home <laughs> runs. They're calling it gorilla ball. We know what gorilla ball used to mean in the 90s. I think they mean it means a little bit something different uh, for Arkansas this year. It's more of a mindset, uh, an approach. Uh, first off, what are your thoughts on the gorilla mask? I love it. I really do. Now I got to uh, challenge you on this. I, I wanted you to say this. What is the difference between the gorilla mask and the daddy hat at Tennessee? Well, I think it's the way Arkansas does it. They do okay. it all inside the dugout. They have to do it inside the dugout yeah. now. Or you get ejected. They're not showing anyone up. Yeah. They're. I don't know. And and look, it, maybe I have Razorback goggles on. <laughs> To me, the the hat, I don't know. I, th I just the way that whole they they did that whole thing was annoying to me. Um, plus, they flip people off and they run around the bases. Razorbacks don't yeah. do that, Matt. But I, I I like it because I'll tell you, I interviewed Nolan Souza after the game on Friday night, and now it was the first night of yep. the Gorilla Ball thing, and he was holding that gorilla like a little freaking teddy bear, just squeezing. Now let me him. say this real quick for people who haven't seen this: they've got the gorilla mask they put on after the home runs, and then the player of the game. It's a little toy gorilla that they get to keep until the next game. So continue. Yeah. So it's a toy gorilla. It's probably, I don't know, 12 inches, uh, 12, 15 inches tall. Mm -hmm. Plastic gorilla. And Nolan Souza had a hold of that thing, and he was so proud. It's like a puppy when you give him a little chew toy. He was so proud of that that gorilla and he carried that thing around he was just hugging it during the interview mm -hmm. and uh kendall diggs had given it to him so then the next day he gives it to uh i want to say peyton stovall got it the next day yep. then stovall gave it to Aloy. that's right and it wasn't necessary Aloy had a couple of base hits but they pointed out you know at the end of the game that you know stovall's like you know um we're going to give it to Aloy. Had it started out the first game, uh, first at bat with an eleven pitch at bat, yep. drew a walk, ended yep. up scoring, uh, great plays on defense, uh, and a couple big hits. So they gave it to Aloy for that, and I think it's neat. And then so Aloy has it now, so he'll give it to whoever on Thursday night, and hopefully it'll be a big night for someone offensively. It kind of, I, I think some people might hear Gorilla Ball, and they kind of go back to that notion that we were talking about earlier. It's like, oh, here, here's Arkansas trying to hit home runs. <laughs> you coach. And I, I mean, I spent my whole life around coaches. Uh, one of the things that coaches are trying to do is they're trying to find unique ways to hammer home the same message. And I think that's what they're trying to do with this gorilla ball thing that started within the last couple of weeks. Yeah, it's a, it's mental. Baseball is ninety percent mental. I mean, I, I don't care what you say. Everyone at the SEC level has talent, or they wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. You know, we beat down on Missouri. Missouri's got good players. Mm -hmm. They're just not playing good right now. Um, it's it's just give you a little mental edge, and that's all it takes as a hitter. You get up there a little mental edge. You're out in the field, just a little mental edge. Are they thinking about the gorilla during the game? No, but it's just something that they want. They want that thing at the end of the game, and they, I don't know. I, I love it. I absolutely love it, and I love the way that we do it. And it's discreet in the dugout, and the guys love it, and they're feeding off of it. Um, I don't know. Now, if you ask me, if 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 uh, Ole Miss was doing the same thing, I might say, look at that. What's that crap <laughs> they're doing with the gorilla ball? But since the Razorbacks are doing, I love it. And you know what? DVH isn't going to allow anything Bush League to go on. And so I'm, I'm all for it 100%. And if and uh, ever since gorilla ball, we've done, we're have we 3-0. 5-0. It began before the McNeese State game. 
Oh, and five and zero. Okay, yeah. there Before, you go. They, they scored eighteen games. You look at everything through your John Conley rose colored glasses. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I don't think they're going to be playing that as a walkout song either. <laughs> well, Bubba. Appreciate it, man. It's good to be back with you. Yes. And uh, we're going to do this again every week through the end of the season. We appreciate you being with us on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast for the latest on the Razorbacks. Hope you come to our website, wholehogsports.com. You can hear Bubba on the Razorback Sports Network during the games. Until next week, for Bubba Carpenter, I'm Matt Jones. Thank you. Go Hogs. Thanks to Kendall King, where their design talents are showcased by teamwork. Kendall King, Shop Cart, and Soapbox. They're your design professionals with home run stats.